Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's 9 a.m., and congratulations on making it to the hangover panel in the oddly shaped room. Uh, those few of you that have actually made it, I hope you had a chance to brush the sand from between your toes. This morning, we are talking about competition and coalition, and we are going to be focusing more on the second half of that contradiction, on the coalition side. Because here at SICON last year, former Estonian President Thomas Hendrik Ilves called for a cyber NATO. As he put it, uh, a coalition of liberal democracies not bounded or restricted by geography in the way NATO is today, which can better respond to the ubiquity of threats. And that is what we're going to be talking about this morning. Whether we want such a thing, whether we can have such a thing, what it might look like, what it might do. but. What struck me was the, the reciprocity of President Ilves's suggestion with what the adversaries say. Because, after all, one of the key advantages of information warfare, if you read Russian thought leaders, is that there are no rear areas in information warfare. You can deliver effects to the entire depth of enemy territory. In other words, Infowar is not a North Atlantic challenge. It is a far broader problem. So why might it be that uh, NATO, as it exists at the moment, might not be able to handle a problem of this kind? Well, over the years here at SICON, as the regular attendees will know, there have been plenty of rehearsals of the limitations of NATO. It's been criticized, sometimes unfairly. Some people say that uh, uh, NATO cyber policy focuses on the O in NATO, just protecting its own organization, its own networks, and nothing further is being done. The l NATO looks after itself not the Allies. As I said, that's sometimes unfair, but it is true that the pace of operationalizing some of the statements and declarations that NATO has made might have seemed impressive in a former era when threats were less urgent, but may not be quite so appropriate now for when the problems are immediate and on our faces. Sometimes what you call something is actually indicative of how you feel about it. And in the case of NATO, of course, cyber still comes under the emerging security challenges division. Whereas for every other organization that is re represented at this conference, this is a challenge which has emerged some time ago, so much so, in fact, that it is a mature problem which is fully integrated in national security and in war fighting. Now, we heard the head of the Emerging Security Challenges Division, Dr. Antonio Missiroli, talk about NATO's responses, and he was positive and upbeat, as people in his position invariably are. And he talked about how NATO was responding and gave a list of things that must be done. If you listen closely, you might have recognized that his list of things that must be done was considerably longer and more substantive than his list of things that are actually being done at the moment. So where does that leave us? Is it possible that we need an alternative organization which would be a parallel structure to NATO, which would reach the parts that other alliances cannot reach? And in order to consider that, we've got three extremely knowledgeable people on the podium with us today. From the far end, we have Kim Hartman, who will be a familiar face to you if you've been uh, attending SciCon regularly. She's, been put, she's put in seven years here with uh, papers presented always with a very solid foundation of technical knowledge underpinning her conclusions. In fact, I think this is the first time that SciCon has succeeded in tempting her away from the tech track and actually joining in with the policy and strategy. So welcome, Kim. Thank you, Rich. Next, we have Martin Libicki, who has, is known to us as a deep cyber thinker, but in fact has a much broader expertise and experience that he can bring to bear on cyber problems. He's particularly concerned, for our purposes, with the practical national security implications of information technology, and in particular, he's written at length about the limitations of current approaches. Martin, good morning. Good morning. And Mer Merle Maigre, who's past roles make her probably uniquely qualified to address this question. Because not only has she served her country as the long-term national security advisor to the president, she's also been embedded within NATO in the belly of the beast in NATO headquarters, so knows the organization from the inside. And people here, of course, will know her as the, most, uh, as the former director of CCDCOE. So from all of these angles, she brings relevant experience to bear on assessing what might actually be organizationally feasible when addressing a problem of this kind. 
Now, the division of labor between the three, because they're coming from such different approaches, is going to be fairly simple. You will have seen from the, the blurb for this panel that we are bridging topics. Well, we're also pulling together strands from a lot of the other panels that you have seen over the last few days. We will have Kim, first of all, outlining what has happened to date. Whether in the period since President Ilves' repeated call for a cyber NATO, we see trends emerging in international practice which look like that being implemented. Whether we see things which might in fact suggest that there is a tacit cyber NATO already emerging, even without any, uh, any formal declaration. As after all, we heard Brigadier General, Brigadier General Bianc uh, talking about the United States' strategies to mitigate risk through collaboration and coalition building and cyber exchange cells and declassifying to the lowest common denominator. Everything that sounds like an alliance which is working in parallel with NATO. And there are other examples which Kim will walk us through to see what has been happening over the last year. Martin will be discussing the paper that you may already have seen in the conference proceedings, his proposal for a Baltic cyber alliance and a practical case study of how this might work, exploring both the advantages and the challenges. And of course, some of those challenges, as I hope Martin will explain, are common to NATO or any other organization, such as, for example, thresholds of response, which is a problem that is not going to go away with a new organization for dealing with it. As Martin puts it, uh, somewhere on the spectrum between mischievous speech and Armageddon, every alliance needs to draw some line between acceptable and unacceptable practice. And finally, Merle is going to embellish all of that with some of the conceptual challenges and opportunities for an organization of this kind. But for instance, the boundaries of membership and of jurisdiction and of responsibility, thinking about cyber operations versus information operations, not a distinction that our adversaries draw. Would a new organization do the same? Where exactly do the boundaries of, quote, cyber, unquote, lie? And who's in and who's out? If it's an alliance of democracies, how do you set the criteria for bringing people in? Each of our speakers is going to speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and we will take all of the, the questions at the end. We have three very distinct approaches to the topic. We've got three very distinct presentational styles. You will see every possible combination of sitting, standing, wandering about. But the one thing I can promise you is that there is a common factor between all of them. Unusually for PSYCON and for this audience, today, this morning, is a PowerPoint-free zone. So, Kim, over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kier, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone, to, uh, in this room. Uh, thank you all for coming to this very early session. I know there's been a beach party yesterday, and uh, as Kier pointed out, I've been here a couple of times. So I know that these parties uh, before the last day tend to go on quite long. So I'm glad you all made it. And I also want to be, uh, give a big thank you to the organizers of this year's SICOM, which uh, I believe have put together an excellent conference again and uh, this year, and for letting me speak in front of this audience. So, those who, of you who know me from previous years uh, know that I do have a reputation of um, giving a rather technical presentation, usually in the technical track. So it's my first time being on a policy track, actually. Um, but uh, don't be alarmed. As I said, you are in the right room, you are on the policy track, everything's fine. And, um, I will be talking about um, one of the recent uh, trends that we have um, explored in 2018. And um, with that, I want to welcome you to this presentation on the no longer so silent battle and cyber conflict. So in 2018, what we observed as cybersecurity professionals, which is actually something we have been observing for quite some years, is of course there have been a numerous amount of uh, larger and smaller cyber incidents that were reported and that have been discussed in the media. However, compared to the previous years, what we found in 2018 as significant was a significant, and I mean statistically significant, rise of the number of state evolved incident reports. And it's not just that we suddenly see these kind of reports popping up everywhere, it's actually also that we see a change in the amount and quality of information that is being provided. So, based on the continuously delivered reports of significant cyber incidents that are being released by the Center of Strategic and International Studies, um, we were observing that the portion of official inc uh, incident reports that were um, proactively 
also offering background information on the incidents observed um, made up a total of 45% of the reports made in 2018. So speaking in clear numbers, there were 51 reports that we found um, in 2018 of these type of reports compared to AIDS in 2016. So while it is true that there was a general rise of more reports getting on the, on the net and being discussed, um, even if you still do the statistics, you will still find it's a significant rise. So um, just in case you wonder what the CSIS actually means by significant attacks, um, significant attacks are all those that are um, targeting co uh, governmental defense or high-tech companies with an economic or with an economic loss of greater than $1 million. <clears throat> so what I'm going to be talking about is um, some of the examples, the most prominent ones that we saw in 2018, um, but I'm not just going to be talking about cyber incidents because this is a trend that is actually not just manifesting itself in, for cyber incident reporting, but in, for incident reporting in general, um, which we saw in 2018. So the first one that I'm going to pick up um, is the NotPetya ransomware attack. And I find this very interesting to pick up because it was actually observed in 2017 by academia and technical um, professionals. Um, and it was discussed by the public previously in 2017. Um, but it was not until early 2018 that official statements were made by the US authorities linking the attack to, Rus to the Russian Federation. Um, so this. This uh, claim was later supported by UK, Denmark, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and um, later on supported by Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, and Sweden. And this is very interesting to observe because you actually don't just see that this um, uh, that uh, the attribution was being made by, a, by a, a government of other authorities in 2018, but you also see the first time that this very coordinated way um, of um, reporting on the, on the incidents of, of actually supporting each other's claims. So the second incident that was reported that was very prominent um, is the OPCV hack in uh, the hack, um, which was reported by the Netherlands in autumn 2018. Uh, with almost simultaneous announcements made by UK and US. So again, you have not just the attribution and the, the stating of the attack being made, but you also have, again, this coordinated way of, um, of attribution by uh, different states. And uh, what was interesting, very interesting about this case, um, from a technical, more technical perspective, um, because this is something that technical speakers do tend to, ha to feel is not being done that much, um, is that the indictments were actually con uh, contained quite some detailed descriptions on the activities of the in individual GRU officers arrested. And this was including account and domain names, as well as times and locations of online activities. We were also presented with a couple of pictures of technical devices and information on them. So, apart from these two cyber incidents that were observed in 2018, Certainly, most prominently non-cyber incident reported and discussed globally in 2018 must have been the Salisbury attack. <coughs> so the Salisbury attack, what I'm going to summarize like this is um, in September 2018, the British government disclosed details on the two suspects and the poisoning of the scribbles. What followed was a debate in the UN Security Council which was initiated, initiated by the UK, that led to the release of the statements of leaders of US, France, Germany, and Canada, who are actually backing up Britain's assessment. What followed must have been a diplomatic, very, well, very diplomatic um, case of um, trying to ally how to, to cope with the situation, but in the end, more than 20 countries subsequent, uh, subsequently supported the UK in its allegations and expelled more than 100 Russian diplomats among them. So why I'm picking on the Salisbury attack example that much 
is that it actually showed the trend that we are observing of cooperated and co coordinated state response that utilizes the power of transparency in two ways. So first of all, we saw the international coordination, coordination as demonstrated by the UN Security Council. And secondly, we saw how the power of transparency really hit the case and made it not just globally known, but also gave you a common sense of uh, situational awareness. So the UK was releasing a limited amount of information on the Salisbury case, um, by which it only disclosed a limited amount of its capabilities. So of course, when you are talking about information sharing, this is all, always an issue you are having, is how much information do I want to share without actually giving too much information on what my capabilities are and how I'm actually operating. But at the same time, by doing that, by just releasing a selected and limited amount of information, you, the, uh, the UK was actually tapping into the enormous power of the media worldwide to join the dots and complete the case. So, summarizing on the trend that we saw, um, what changed is, first of all, we have the confirmation of attack by states, which we have seen in previous years also, but then it barely just were, was a statement um, made, okay, we had an attack. We were there were confirmations around that there is an attack going on or there was an attack going on. Mostly it was after the attack with some time in between, so it was just saying, okay, there has been an attack. The second thing that we saw um, is a significant rise in attribution. Um, and we also saw um, that there is a selective disclosure of intelligence service information and um, especially all three of them being done in a co coordinated way among allies. So one of the questions that has been actually discussed at a couple of instances within this, um, this conference is why. So, and to answer this question, one particular uh, talk that I would like to point you to, if you haven't seen it, I hope you've been there, um, was by, uh, presented by Jill Barham from Tel Aviv University, who presented her research um, at CyCon on Wednesday um, in her talk, Coverage or Not, National Strategy During the Cyber Conflict, um, where she actually in investigated how um, it is an advantage of choosing to be transparent. Um, another aspect that I would like to pick up, which I um, liked particularly, um, was uh, made by or stated by Brigade General Maria Biang, um, which she mentioned that why we want to be transparent is actually to get a common situ situational awareness. And um, to create this common situational awareness, and this is really the point that, is, that I want to stress, um, is if we want to do this, so this is, this is our goal, we want to have a common situational awareness, we have to ask ourselves, am I getting that at this point, and if not, why am I not getting it? So to create this, we have to get a consent on the conclusions that are being drawn and the attributions that are being made. So what we should discuss is actually what information must be disclosed, what information can I keep to myself, in what way do I have to present this and to whom? So that in order to empower um, to the, or allies to actually reproduce the conclusions we are making, and not just our allies, but actually also to be thinking about if we are moving into cyber conflict, we don't just want our allies to be on our side. We actually want to be able to um, explain to the public why we are doing this and why we are acting in this, in, in this certain way. And we don't just have to think of our public as in the, the public living in the countries we are living in, but we also have to think about the public in those countries that were, not, that were not our allies. So we have to be transparent about this. So, <clears throat> let me be absolutely clear on this. Uh, transparency is absolutely a good thing, not just because it's one of the key pillars of liberal and democratic republics um, in, in cyber incident reporting, but um, we need to ensure that we all have common sense of 
the information that we're looking at and the conclusions that are being drawn. So just taking a quote from last year's cycle to, to show you how the way of we are, the, the, we are seeing the situation actually changes from the, the way your academic background is. Um, I'm going to quote, attribution is not a problem. So and this is something that last year in the policy track, I believe, um, was said, and most people were fine with that. And it has been repeated this year in the law track. I saw that in uh, Lee Fields' uh, talk, um, that attribution is not a problem. But if you're looking at the technical people, I remember last year when, when I heard that and um, I was sitting next to a couple of technical guys and we were all just like, whoa, wait a second. Yeah, attribution is a problem in technical terms. So this is just one example how different people coming from different areas have a very different perspective of what you need to do to actually feel confident to attribute. So it's a completely different thing if you want to be confident in attribution from a policy point of view, because you can just rely on, okay, this was my ally stating that, and I trust my ally, so I feel confident of stating that this, that this is the case um, as seen. Um, as well, from a law perspective, you can feel certain if you have a couple of rules that are being applied <clears throat> and, and that are right. But from a technical point of view, you, what you really want to look into is the digital forensics that has been made. And we are still concerned with the final step in the digital um, forensic, which is actually the attribution of the to the real person that was sitting in front of the computer. But while that is something where you can actually say, okay, this was stated by my ally, or we have intelligence services available that are showing this to me, and you can trust them, that's fine. But you still want to see the digital forensics being done. And that's actually something that's great about the situation, is because digital forensics is working in a way where you can actually um, disclose quite a lot of information without having to disclose too much of your capabilities. And at the same time, you do not have to, to, to touch the data. Yeah, you, you get a copy, a dig digital copy, you can multiply it thousands of times and give it to any person around who feels competent in judging on, on the situation. So I'm going to close this with the thought on that I would really love to see a discussion on how we should do that, what information we should be sharing, and um, how we should disclose it, and uh, whether or not we should actually have an institution that is uh, capable of controlling the information and the inf attribution that is being made. So, thank you very much for the talk. I've enjoyed speaking here and I hope to see forward to the discussion. Martin, over to you. Okay. Um. I'm here to uh, entertain the notion of a Baltic Cyberspace Alliance. When I mentioned this to uh, an attendee at the icebreaker, she looked kind of shocked and said, you must be in favor of breaking up NATO. Did the Russians pay for your work? So, let me start off. I'm not in favor of breaking up NATO. I understand the nuclear umbrella, got that. An attack on one and is an attack on all, got that, okay? If NATO finds itself in a kinetic operation and you need cyberspace operations to support that kinetic operation, they also come under NATO, got that too. But, if we're talking about cyberspace operations, Outside the context of, context of kinetic warfare, is this necessarily best understood as being part of NATO operations? Okay? So, the Russians definitely didn't pay for this paper. The U.S. government did, because I'm an employee of the U.S. government, so I have to put in my standard caveat, these are my own opinions, not representative of the U.S. government as a whole. Okay, so those of you who are otherwise worried can relax. Let's start off with the problem that we're talking about, and the problem, as we all recognize, is a sharp and difficult increase in the level of Russian information warfare, of which cyberspace operations are an important component, directed against many countries, but disproportionately directed against countries of the Baltic region. Okay, there is the problem. Now, when I propose a Baltic Cyberspace Alliance, it's going to be necessary for me to define three terms. Baltic, Cyberspace, and Alliance. So let's get started. Uh, Baltic countries, right? Uh, a lot of countries touch the Baltic. Uh, Germany is the one I have in mind, right? They do have a Baltic coast. I'm going to talk about Sweden and Finland, which are neutral countries. This makes actually a difference. I'm not particularly dogmatic about what's in or what's out. 
Technically, the Netherlands and the Norway do not touch the Baltic. They may have a community of interest. France, maybe. That's not the point. The point is that there is a core of concern in and roughly around that region. OK. Uh, cyberspace. As I pointed out before, I want to make a distinction between cyberspace within the context of kinetic conflict and cyberspace outside that context. And I'm talking more or less outside that context. But cyberspace is in many ways a shorthand for the broad field of information warfare because the Russian challenge to the West is not simply in moving ones and zeros. There has been a large electronic warfare component, notably the jamming of GPS in the Black Sea. There is, as many of you know much better than I do, a what we could call psychological operations component. Okay, To Russia, it's a broad mix. So that when you talk about cyberspace, I want to understand a somewhat broader definition. Let me come to the, the, the most difficult word here of all, and that's an alliance. What does exactly alliance mean? Now, I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to ask the question. Generally speaking, most organizations have to defend their own systems themselves for a lot of complicated reasons I don't want to get into. And that leaves the question, how can outside assistance be useful? Okay, this isn't one of these cases in kinetic warfare where if you mass forces together, you end up with bigger forces than the other guy has, right? Um, there are no Lanchester laws in the field of cyberspace. So specifically, what in fact can you do in common? Well, it turns out that in cyberspace, there are actions that can be, that are, that, and I'm an economist, offer econ economies of scale that in fact they are more cost effective to do collectively than they are to do individually. Intelligence, well, we talk about intelligence sharing because it's much more efficient to have people collect various forms of intelligence and integrate it than it does to have everybody collect all of their intelligence on all the same stuff, okay? Forensics is another one where there are economies of scale because forensics is incidental. You go from basically one attack to another. Here, if you concentrate effort you can achieve economies of scale. Lessons learned, which is in many ways the flip side of intelligence. What have we learned about cyberspace, okay? There are many opportunities for collaboration. Now, if you extend this, global cooperation is better than, than European collaboration is gonna be better than sub-European sub collaboration. But again, you deal with what, what you have. Now, more controversially is offense, right? Uh, offense comes in two types. One of them can be called, is called persistent engagement, which is basically as you challenge the cyber forces of another country. And the other one can be termed, terms, uh, can be termed as retaliation or some sort of response. Something that lets other folks know that they cannot attack you with impunity. Both of them are relatively underdeveloped as in many ways as the entire field of cyberspace in general, okay? Um, so let me ask the obvious question, why not NATO? And here I want to again go down two tracks. The first track is that a lot of what is understood as alliance defense makes sense, more sense in other media than they do in cyberspace. If you can overgeneralize, and I do that for a living, um, there are sort of three functions of external defense. One is interposition, right? You have something you want to defend here. I add to the forces over here that keep these guys from penetrating my lines and getting to you, you know, getting to what I want to protect. Clearly, in cyberspace, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Another uh, assistance that can be done from the outside is to uh, disarm the other side. Very Clausewitzian notion, OK? We really don't know how to disarm attackers in cyberspace through offensive action. We're beginning to learn how you can hobble them a little bit, cripple them a little bit, cause delays in them, raise their expenses, but we really don't know how to disarm people. It's not entirely clear that this is feasible, short of kinetic methods. And the third thing is deterrence, right? An alliance, a group of folks who are pledged to respond to provocations collectively may form more of a deterrence. Okay, deterrence, however, is kind of problematic and I will get into that in a minute, actually fairly minute, uh, fairly soon. When I ask the question, why not NATO? L not to put too fine a point on it, I'm asking, why not the United States, right? Why can't the United States take on the responsibility of defending Europe? Okay, couple of geopolitical lessons. 
We have a current president. We also had a past president. Both presidents have agreed on certain themes in their foreign policy. One of them is we are increasingly concerned about China. We are increasingly concerned about competition across the Pacific, and that necessarily comes in competition with other forms of other, that necessarily competes with other forms of competition, right? This isn't the Cold War anymore. Both presidents have urged Europe to spend more for their national defense. That's not going to go away no matter who gets elected or re-elected in 2020, okay? It's a theme of American foreign policy. Second issue is that the United States Alliance in Cyberspace has a name, and that name is the Five Eyes. Right? Why is that true? Because cyberspace operations depends on intelligence, because we do our SIGINT collectively, uh, individually, but we group with the UK, with Australia, with New Zealand, with Canada. Only one of those five countries is European. And in fact, there is a greater, I don't know this for a fact, but dollars to donuts, there's a greater amount of sharing of intelligence within the Five Eyes than there is in the rest of NATO. In other words, from a cyberspace perspective, there's already a two-tiered alliance when it comes to cyberspace operations, and that's undeniable. The third issue is one of thresholds, and I will get back to that again. When does the United States react? And for this example, I'm going to make the point that the United States threshold for helping allies is a lot higher than it is for helping itself. Case in point, South Korea. South Korea has undergone a very large set of attacks from North Korea. The cost can be roughly estimated of all cyber operations in the billions of dollars. Has the United States basically retaliated or even talked about retaliation or responding to the North Korean attacks on South Korea? The answer is no, although there is mutual assistance between these two countries. However, when North Korea attacked Sony, causing damage in the tens of millions of dollars, the United States did react, right? Because that was an American outfit that they, basically the activity was headquartered in the United States, that they attacked and not an allied outfit. I don't think that's going to be much different in Europe, okay? That our thresholds of responses are going to be lower, uh, higher, excuse me, in Europe than they are in the United States. And again, that has to be considered. Okay, so what are the, some of the advantages of taking a look at a more localized alliance vis-a-vis -vis a globe-spanning NATO? First, is you can get an easier consensus on action. Now, what do I mean? There are three things you have to ask yourself. What cyberspace activities are actionable? Which ones do you want to respond to? I had already mentioned thresholds, but there's another one, and that is what in the world of information warfare is actionable? Um, is propaganda an actionable insult, an actionable um, measure for which you can take a countermeasure. Well, the United States has a fairly dogmatic, I happen to like it, view on freedom of speech. European nations, not quite as dogmatic, okay? Um, if you had to try to get a consensus between the United States on one hand, Europe on the other hand, for activities that are not zeros and ones related, you might have a problem. If you take more like-minded countries together, you'll have less of a problem. So in terms of thresholds, in terms of categorization, you're more likely to get a consensus. Second issue, what level of confidence do you need in attribution in order to take action against other countries? Again, the United States and Europe may have different notions of what's considered adequate confidence. My hunch is that if you put the Baltic countries together, you are more likely to come with a consensus. I use the word hunch advisedly. I have no proof of that, but it seems to be a reasonable expectation. Finally, what are the appropriate means to use coming back, right? What is a legitimate target? What is a legitimate operation? What is a legitimate level of collateral damage? What kind of care do you take? These are things that have to be agreed on. And a smaller group is more likely to come to an agreement than a larger group. Okay, now don't all of these problems exist in the other spheres? And I would argue not nearly to the extent, okay? If there was dialing back to the Cold War era, a Soviet invasion of the inner German border using a company or using a core or anything else like that, essentially it's the same. That is not true in cyberspace. And I don't want to quote Kier quoting me, so I'll just <laughs> ask you to remember what he said. Okay, 
Second advantage, it allows the Europeans to take a leadership role in something. Okay? That, hey, that's important from a U.S. perspective. That is an important from the U.S. perspective. Uh, technically, I, I, used to work, um, I used to work in OPNAV in the 1980s, and I noticed the one area that the Europeans took, in a, took the lead on was countermine warfare, which, if you think about it, makes a great deal of sense given the nature of mine warfare, right? Okay. Um, here, I believe I'm pushing on an open door. And I'll give you an example, then I'll have to walk it back a little bit. If you take a look at Germany, Germany has a cyber core, which constitutes 8% of the German armed forces, roughly 15,000 people out of 190, right? The US has a cybercom, which constitutes 0.4% of the manpower of the US DOD, a 20 to 1 difference. Now, if you actually ask the Germans, they'll say, hold it. It's not quite like that. I got it. They have a lot of things in their version of CyberCore. We don't have in our version of CyberCore. But it does suggest that at least notionally, and in terms of narrative, the Germans have stepped up to uh, the cyberspace problem. Similar things are going on in France. This, if you had to ask the Europeans, based on their actions, or what an economist would call revealed preference, where they want to take the lead, they'd probably mention cyber. So in, in this case, I am pushing on an open door. Second, another advantage, Sweden and Finland. These are not NATO countries, but the issue of joining NATO is very hotly debated. One of the problems that the, both countries have is the risk of a neuralgic reaction from Russia. Russia has long memories. They fought Finland in 1939. They fought Sweden in the early 18th century, right? And it is fairly easy for the Russians to paint the Swedes and the Finns as the jackbooted thugs, right? Makes no sense in this part of the world. You may, it's, it's amazing what can make sense in Moscow if you really work it, okay? Cyberspace, I cannot guarantee you that it's not going to evoke that reaction. I think I can argue it's less likely to evoke that reaction, okay? And an, an alliance which, in fact, includes Sweden and Finland, both of whom have a lot of assets to bring to the table in cyberspace, is one that is basically is a halfway house to NATO. If they, look at the, if they think they enjoy and need to work with their European allies in defense matters, they can go one way. If they find out that, in fact, that doesn't work, it allows them to go the other way. It, it, it's, it's a partial commitment with much less proportional risk. And finally, in terms of advantages, is it complicates Russian strategy to have two groups of opponents rather than one group of opponents, OK? And now, being an academic, I would be remiss if I didn't go and talk about the other side, the challenges. First challenge is, any time you have two alliances working on similar problems, you, also, you can have a gap. In other words, I don't know how many baseball fans are here, but if the left fielder and the center fielder both think the other one's going to get the baseball, you have a problem. Okay? For those of you who don't know baseball, we'll continue. So um, take a look at NotPetya. You have the Maersk and Merck effect. Maersk, Danish shipping company, lost hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from NotPetya. Merck, American pharmaceutical company, lost hundreds of millions of dollars from NotPetya, right? If there were to be a response, who would take the lead? Well, that has to be coordinated, right? One more thing that you have to do. Second of all is, is there is at least a notional risk of a cascade. In other words, when you have two alliances with overlapping membership, with non... non that look like this. <laughs> Okay, you have the possibility that a conflict with a non-alliance member ends up being a conflict with the other alliance. Under the circumstances, I think that's highly notional, but as an academic, I have to bring that up. And finally, more practically, there's a boundary between tactical cyberspace operations and strategic cyberspace operations. Just when you think, as an academic, that you've got these categories clean, somebody comes off with an example that doesn't look like one or doesn't look like the other. Okay? Now... So here it is, I'm an American telling Europeans what to do. You can take that with a grain of salt, but I did want to introduce the idea into the dialogue. Thank you, Morrison. Marilla. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll try to respond and react uh, to, to what's said before. Uh, and as a Euro European, uh, perhaps also argue for the case of the leadership uh, taken. Um, and, and of the leadership that, that can or has been taken at various formats 
on this side of the Atlantic. Um, first of all, uh, let me address back the original idea that you here brought out that, uh, that has sort of like is, we haven't mentioned, like the, the, the previous speakers haven't mentioned, but, but you did of like the, 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 the idea put forward by President Ilves of a, of a sort of cyber NATO. Um, although Ilves uh, strongly uh, circulated it in his last year's PsyCon opening speech, I should recall, as, um, as a historian at heart, that actually, um, if we go back to the facts, uh, the uh, idea uh, originally came from his speech at PsyCon in 2016. Uh, so three years ago uh, from today in 2016, when he um, put, put forward the idea for the first time, as you said here, calling for not NATO, but a club of uh, rule of law based democratic countries that could, um, could certify software and hardware where membership is a privilege, but also comes with some uh, carries benefits uh, to those who join. Um, and, and rather than uh, uh, starting to right away um, measure the uh, pluses and minuses of that idea, let, let's measure the value of that idea in, in that time. I think uh, back in 2016, Ilvas underlined the importance of to think about uh, um, international uh, cooperation and coalition among nations on cyber outside of NATO because there wasn't much of that going on. Today, we are in a different uh, setting. Um, as uh, Kim told us, we've uh, seen various attributions uh, in uh, late 2017, starting with WannaCry attribution, but also, as you, as you rightly said, the uh, NotPetya attribution in uh, February 2018, and, and all the other attributions that we've seen later last year. Um, we've seen various different coalitions of, uh, of uh, forming on cyber. Uh, and uh, from my own first-hand experience, I remember how, um, how the topic of, of cyber security and cyber policy has evolved. I mean, back in uh, September 2007, when I assumed the role of director of, 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 uh, of heading the NATO CCD COE, it was very complicated to draft a press statement on one of the uh, red against red exercises that this center does, the cross swords. I mean, we were struggling to find words how to explain the outer world about uh, cross swords uh, exercise uh, because it really is uh, about the offensive skills. But back in, uh, in uh, 2017, it didn't go down very well. Uh, and in order to avoid conflict with NATO headquarters, we were talking about active response, uh, uh, active defense, uh, which is also all true, but we just didn't call the spade a spade. By um, a, a year later, basically by 2018, uh, we have the French uh, defense minister uh, in a large cyber uh, conference in Lille very openly announced the French offensive cyber doctrine. I mean, we are much more uh, comfortable about talking it. NATO itself, uh, since uh, its summit last uh, summer in, in Brussels, uh, has become more comfortable about offensive um, when a number of allies announced their sovereign effects on cyber, basically talking about the offensive effects. Um, more nations joined up, have joined up later. Um, the NATO section last week in the, uh, in the London Cyber Pledge Conference was pretty open about NATO becoming more stronger in its um, posture against cyber attacks. So I think when, uh, I, I take your criticism when you say that uh, the NATO ASG uh, has a longer list of things to do in his to-do list than, than in the list of accomplished things. Um, yet that's somewhat normal. <laughs> I guess it's also a, a reflects a vision. And by the way, Kier, when you um, say that um, the emerging security challenges uh, division is a somewhat um, uh, uh, re reflects a redundancy in its in its uh, title, then uh, I hope I'm not cast uh, share, um, 
sharing our secrets, but, but there are plans to rename it uh, um, to asymmetric threats uh, department. So I guess uh, it's, it's also the labeling is, is, is uh, being updated. So um, while thinking of uh, a need for a localized sort of uh, cyber alliance, I, I would raise doubts about uh, uh, costing NATO away. It's like um, saying that your relationship doesn't work, and and, uh, and rather than than making it making it better, um, you you expect someone new coming along, and that's that then working working better. Um, NATO uh, NATO's decision making procedure surely is not perfect, but I think. Uh, uh, that is being recognized. And when we see, for example, the uh, importance that is being uh, given to exercises, both at strategic and operational level in NATO on cyber, I'm impressed. I mean, regularly at the CMX, the crisis management exercises uh, over the past four years, cyber has played a very important role. Um, NATO is recognizing, uh, well, uh, when, when speaking of like standing against Russia, um, you mentioned uh, Russia using GPS uh, jamming in the Black Sea, uh, which raises questions to me uh, about the need to focus on the Baltic exclusively because um, I agree. Uh, we've seen that uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, we've seen uh, Russia's attacks uh, to a large extent being directed towards Ukraine. Um, the electronic warfare jamming, but also election interference. Uh, we've seen uh, and read reports of uh, Russia uh, jamming the GPS um, back in the uh, uh, high north uh, during the Trident Juncture exercise. Um, so the question of, of, of the need to build a regional cyber alliance so that we'd be better um, because this is where Russia's attacks are targeted, I'm not entirely sure uh, as long as you leave Ukraine out, for example, and uh, with um, election interference uh, going on all the way from U.S. Uh, to, to France, uh, the question really um, uh, is, I think, um, whether we can single out a specific geographical re region that is being targeted. So, uh, and last but not least, speaking of, of NATO and the geographical limits, I would like to underline um, the value of uh, the CCDCOE, the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, one of the 25, I think, NATO Centers of Excellence, which in itself, I think, is a model of a novel approach to, uh, to um, including members beyond uh, the Northern Atl Atlantic Alliance itself. I mean, um, CCDCOE, being a NATO center of excellence, still has uh, Sweden, Finland, and Austria as its member. Um, I think in two, two weeks, uh, there will be four more additional NATO members joining, which, which makes the membership in this center uh, covering almost all of NATO alliance, uh, allies, but in addition, uh, we have um, Japan and Australia that are intended to join very soon, and I'm sure if uh, New Zealand is interested, uh, um, the door would not be closed. So, um, I see the flexibility uh, in <coughs> both uh, um, as a platform for nations, for multi-tier nations coming together, existing already uh, in NATO or within the NATO framework. Um, surely, yes, I mean, NATO is a multi-tier alliance. You have some allies who are uh, stronger in some capabilities and, and, and that is visible in, in the same um, voluntary list of uh, NATO members who have come up with their uh, offensive effects. Uh, uh, UK, US, uh, Netherlands, Denmark, uh, Estonia, Nor uh, Norway, Germany, France, and Lithuania. Maybe I'm, I hope I'm not leaving anybody else. So, but the very value of NATO, I think, is to tie US together with its European allies. And I think um, when we list of uh, reasons why it is growingly difficult 
we shouldn't uh, cast uh, the baby out with the water, but, but rather try to um, work on this uh, connection, where, um, making this link or making this relationship uh, better for, for how, how better we can. Now, moving on to, from NATO to, uh, to an area that where um, the European nations um, could take leadership. Uh, I'd like to talk about EU. I think this is a, EU is a, is a place where European nations definitely have taken leadership. I think EU is a, is a wonderful example of recognizing that cyber threats and the need to build resi resilience against cyber threats uh, does not, is not limited to military uh, set of capabilities only, but you need to work on um, bringing the weakest uh, uh, member up to the level and to um, impose legislative uh, requirements uh, on the member states, both gov governance uh, structures as well as uh, private sector, as well as the uh, critical information infrastructure, so that to get them uh, to the level. And I'm thinking of the EU Network Information Security Directive, uh, which, which has done that, which uh, has um, uh, required member states to adopt national strategy on security of network and information systems that has included measures uh, to ensure high levels of security in critical sectors and so on. Um, I'm also thinking of the EU uh, directive on uh, um, um, general data protection regulation. Uh, while originally US has strongly criticized it, I think uh, I'm hearing a lot of nodding uh, agreements that this is uh, an example that is actually worthwhile to follow. And I think the European Union, by uh, adopting this regulation um, that clearly applies just for the EU members, but uh, this is very useful. The, uh, they, by this, they create a useful set of benchmarks that uh, can serve as an example for uh, globally because ultimately uh, this applies for anybody who, who does trade with the EU, uh, uh, EU member states. Uh, finally, on the uh, UN front, um, I think um, uh, there are definitely more than, uh, not just two different uh, frameworks that uh, of opposition to Russia, but, but much more are appearing uh, the UN is, is doubling its work uh, on cyber by announcing back in November both the open-ended working group as well as uh, the, uh, which, which is uh, an initiative proposed by Russia and uh, by uh, continuing work on the group of governmental experts uh, proposal um, put forward by the US and I um, missed the panel, but uh, I'm sure Heli Di Irma uh, yesterday uh, was vocal and clear about the work that is going to be undertaken within these, these formats. Uh, last but not least, when speaking of the role of nations and the uh, opportunities and limits uh, of coalition building, uh, and also speaking of uh, the president's initiative in in in, in Saicon, I uh, would like to um, echo uh, a, a, one of the best um, opening speeches uh, to Saicon by by President Kailulaid yesterday, uh, the two days ago, when where she um, where she announced the importance of states themselves taking the responsibility of explaining where they stand on uh, their understanding of the application of international law. Um, Estonia is not the first one doing it. The UK general prosecutor has uh, given a speech that is widely um, quoted and referred to back in the Chatham House in May last year. Uh, two year. Yeah, last year. Um, France has been very uh, good at, at laying out clearly under Macron administration of where they stand at different 
uh, cyber-related issues, the th thresholds. Uh, they've listed the thresholds in their cyber white paper. I, I mentioned their offensive strategy. And, and now Estonia and the president very clearly uh, voiced the uh, position adopted by the government. So uh, summing up, I think we are, over the course of the last uh, three, four years, we are seeing a multitude of different uh, uh, coalitions and formulations of among the like-minded nations coming up. And I think we should use the uh, existing um, alliances uh, to their best, which uh, doesn't mean that we have to be limited by them, of course, and, and uh, attribution of not Petya um, by um, Five Eyes members, but also additionally a number of countries, and and I'm sure this, the list of attributions uh, attributing uh, will uh, not stop there. Shows that this is possible, that nations can come together, that trust indeed is is key, but um, uh, but I'm I remain skeptical whether we need necessarily to set up new organizations. Uh, in hoping to improve that trust, or rather work on the existing uh, formats and try to make the relationships work. So, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, three very distinct takes on the one problem. And I hope you've got the impression of a very rapidly evolving situation, not only within NATO itself, as Merle has explained, but also all of these ad hoc coalitions, ad hoc agreements, forming between coalitions of the willing and commonalities of interest in response to specific problems. Now, it's true, as Martin says, that uh, a key requirement for that is consensus and, in particular, agreements on tricky issues like attribution. So you do need to have a group of countries that will actually agree between themselves to start with, and it's true that uh, a shared threat perception, as you have, for example, in this region, would be a key driver for that. But then at the same time, we've also heard examples of how that consensus need not necessarily be limited by geography. Now, Martin gave the example of the Five Eyes, of which only one member is actually in Europe for the time being. And we also heard uh, about CCDCE now em embracing um, Australia. Uh, Kim, you may have seen in her paper in the proceedings, gave a number of other examples of coordination and shared transparency, including also, for example, Australia. Why would we not uh, seek to uh, broaden that network further, uh, inviting into CCDO, as you said, New Zealand, or for example, Singapore? There are some things which do actually transcend the geographical barriers. But at the same time, we've also seen organizations emerging to meet similar challenges in other domains. Bis alongside and in parallel with NATO, you have, for example, the formation of the Joint Expeditionary Force, which would seem to duplicate the functions of NATO in some ways, and yet has been set up to, uh, again, reach the, uh, reach the parts that other alliances cannot reach. It's a coalition of the willing again. It's a consensus of opinion. It's Northern Europeans, including those who are not in NATO, joining together to meet a problem and fill a gap. And the uh, Joint Expeditionary Force currently exercising off Denmark heading this way in a few weeks from now. You also have, for example, another European-led initiative uh, that was disclosed uh, just last week, a Zinc Network, led and financed by the UK, bringing together communities of interest across Europe in the counter-disinformation and counter-influence space, including cyber-enabled influence. So these things are happening as we speak, and the key issue of whether the member states in these organizations are members of NATO or not has, as Martin suggested they would be, been sidelined. Sweden and Finland joining the Joint Expeditionary Force with very little controversy except domestically and no visible pushback from Russia. So I agree with the thesis that yes, this is an area in which you can extend that cooperation to bring in other countries with a commonality of interest without necessarily encountering all of the, the Russia problems that are always pointed at as a problem for enlarging NATO itself. So put it all together, and you come back to, to Merle's final and really important question. If we are seeking to fill get perceived gaps in capability or in willingness by NATO, do we actually necessarily need to have a parallel structure or a new organization or is the trend that we see developing at the moment where countries come together for specific topics of interest because they already have 
shared interests, shared consensus, a shared view on the nature of the world and how it should work and how you deal with your adversaries. I'll leave that question open for any of the panelists to, uh, to address if they wish to straight away. And if not, we will take questions from the audience. Well, I would actually do address that but, um, quickly. Um, so I actually feel that the already shared consensus, as you were just saying, um, might actually be a problem. <laughs> so it's not a problem from within, but it may be a problem from how people who are not within this association or who are not within the alliance um, may perceive the judgment made. And that's exactly the point that I was trying to make, um, to make earlier before losing my voice, uh, <laughs> that I do believe, wouldn't it be great to have an organization that is internationally accept accepted and respected, at least in terms of their competency, to make a judgment on cyber incidents going on, so you can at least have the base to say, okay, this is what actually was happening, this is what, what we looked at, not just from a political or military operation point of view, but also from a technical point of view. Um, and then, on top of that, make decisions. So, wouldn't it be great to have such an organization um, as uh, the OPCV is for chemical weapons, or the I IAEA is for mass destruction weapons for cyberspace? Because I believe it's safe to say that cyberspace operations do have the potential of being mass destruction weapons. So I do believe that we do need to get a global consent on the actions that have been taken and what we have been seeing. And we have to be safe about what we are claiming. And it has to be transparent why we are claiming what we do. So even if you have experts within this this alliance, this potential alliance that I'm thinking of in my, in my head. Um, so even if you have um, within those um, experts that do not comply with the overall judgment, you would still, from a technical point of view, would, you would still have, um, of course, the common sense within the alliance. And then, of course, you could also always ask, why are you not complying? What exactly is where, where in the chain of evidence do you see the lack? Can you, can you actually back that up? And that's, that's the big point, because by doing that, you're taking away um, the advantage that... Are, actually, um, I missed the talk, unfortunately, um, that, but it, it is um, a concern that was raised that some countries may actually want to be attributed. Um, because by that, you can actually tap into information warfare and you can actually get all of this... Um, all of, uh, all of the people talking about your capabilities and what you're, what you're doing, and you can actually hang on to that. Um, so you don't want to open that door. You want to close it. So and by actually having such an institution, wouldn't you be able to directly say, okay, you have, your, you have your voice, you can speak, you can say why you don't believe the evidence that, was, uh, that has been publicly announced, um, where's the problem? And if you, don't ha can't, if you can't back up, then maybe you shouldn't say anything. So, Kim, you support the initiative for a shared center where you can uh, present attribution data and, uh, and open it for assessment by, by other countries and achieve some kind of consensus. Do you also support the other implied function of, if we call it a cyber NATO, which is of actually doing something about it? Or would it simply be the kind of attribution center that we've, we've heard proposed from time to time here at SciCon? So um, what you're asking, if I may rephrase that, is uh, whether I would think that um, the center or this op organization or whatever you would call it um, would be uh, capable of actually taking countermeasures. Perfect. Yes, I would. I think, I, I think they would um, because you would have... What, what I always feel is a problem is um, to actually get the common, the common situational awareness for, for everyone to be transparent and to be understood and to be supported. And if you have that basis, I think you can much more easily move and take actions. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, a concrete proposal for a, a, communi a community which is based on attribution as the basis for taking action. We have 26 minutes precisely remaining for questions from the audience. I would suggest, please, if you could wait for the microphone, introduce yourselves, if applicable, say which panel member you actually want to direct the question to, and we will take either one or two or three questions at a time, depending on, uh, on how the time goes. So who would like to be first? Chuck Barry at the back. <coughs> Chuck, if you could wave for the microphone. Thank you. Hi, Chuck Berry at uh, National Defense University. Thank you, Kerr. Thanks for three great uh, presentations. I, I don't think we should be fearful of new organizational structures, uh, but uh, I'm reminded of uh, a saying the Air Force used, uh, if you're a wing walker, uh, you should not let go of something solid that you're holding on to until you have something else solid to hold on to or you'll fall off. So in terms of creating a new organization, I'd be cautious about uh, looking at uh, competing organizations, and I'd look back to see what NATO is already doing in terms of framework nation concepts that exist already uh, in logistics and in, uh, in combat capabilities, for example, F-16 users or uh, the uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Navy, and so forth. We've got cooperations like this. The trouble with cyber, it seems to me, and I'd ask uh, Martin maybe to, to address this, is that it's a domain. Uh, it's not uh, a, a, a discrete capability within a domain. We have uh, in NATO uh, a land component command, and an air component command, and a maritime component command. Uh, maybe we need a, a cyber component command <coughs> that might build along the lines of the SOF headquarters at SHAPE that grew out of a shop, SOF coordination center down in, 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 in Germany uh, some years ago. And maybe all the, all the NATO members who have cyber commands uh, would be welcome to join this voluntarily and pay to, to be part of that outside the command structure initially. Uh, and that way you'd have that capability. The problem with this, uh, General or Admiral Nielsen said uh, the other day, is that this limits it to just defending its own networks. And, we, and uh, when we worked on the Alliance Strategic Concept in 2010, we realized it's not just Article 5 but it's also crisis response and cooperative engagement, right? So we have three missions, three tasks of the Alliance, and that command needs to extend out now to defend uh, not just NATO networks anymore, but defend the, the, the cyber territory of, of NATO members. Uh, so maybe we could look at that, and maybe the attribution center is a way to look. Uh, I don't think we need 100% attribution. It's, you know, reasonable doubt in some countries. There's different, there's different, we just went through CMX 19 and we couldn't reach Article 5 in cyber. Uh, but, but, but uh, you know, you can limit who's, who are the likely culprits and come up with a reasonable decision. So maybe you could comment on this and, and uh, Merlo, I, you know, maybe the EU-NATO collaboration is right there, EDA. There's a lot of things that can be going on there. Well, let's park the attribution issue for the moment because, after all, we have decades of conversations already behind us on, on the difference between attribution in the sense of forensic trails and attribution in the sense of pointing a finger. So, leaving that one aside for the moment, Martin, did you want to tackle that and maybe, Meadow, you have something yeah, to say? Yeah, I, I feel like we're having a fierce debate between the notion that um, the centrality of, no, of NATO does not preclude alternative alliance arrangements and the other point of view that the existence of alternative alliance arrangements does not preclude the centrality of NATO. Um, Short and sweet. I agree, uh, but uh, absolutely well, yeah. on that. Uh, but uh, mm, when talking about what NATO is or isn't, it's important to recognize what's already done. So uh, great suggestion, <coughs> but there already is a cyber operations center being set up um, last year within NATO command structure uh, within the shape, with uh, uh, exactly the roles that it is, well, it's, it's in the process of being set up, but yes, uh, they assume role for uh, including cyber in operational planning for NATO, uh, and they have the role to insert cyber into, into exercises. The cyber Can I also so, sorry, Martin. make a, a distinction here? 
An alliance and a coalition are two very separate creatures. An alliance is a family. People do things they don't want to do for the purpose of keeping the family together. A coalition is like a pickup basketball team. It's convenient for all the members, but it's, the strength of its membership is a function of its convenience. I'm going to have to launch into cricket metaphors shortly. Here, but... <laughs> well, excuse me. <laughs> the Sayoc in itself is, is actually um, one of the things um, for which unfair criticism has been leveled at NATO. Because yes, something is being done. But then you look at the date for full operational um, capability of the Sayoc, and it's 2023. It's well into the next decade, which some people think is a reflection of, again, a, a lack of urgency within NATO. But as I said, that is an unfair criticism. Now, um, quick admin note. Everybody that's hovering at the back, I know some of you are very comfortable hovering at the back, but there are plenty of seats down at the front if you do want to, to take the weight off. We had a lot of, um, of hands from this part of the room. Who else would like to put a question in? Uh, sir, in blue sweater. Hi, Stefan Susanto um, from the ETH Zurich. Um, and former Randite working around Europe, so thanks, Martin. Um, I have a question for you in terms of your alliance. Um, why would countries join a domain-specific alliance that would expose them to dependencies and security threats elsewhere. Um, do you envision your alliance to work on the dictum what happens in cyberspace stays in cyberspace, or um, how should it work? Because it it's looks very complicated. For example, if Germany and Poland are in this alliance, what if the Russians run an op against Poland? Does this interfere in German's position on Nord Stream, for example? So you have all these spillover effects otherwise. Uh -huh. um, would be great to get your comment. Thanks. Um, you had several threads, you, you, you put down so many threads of thought that I think I got some of them tangled. Um, in such an alliance, under a situation, a cyber operation carried out against Poland would be treated by Germany as if it was carried out against Germany, okay? Is that going to get in the way of relations between Germany and Austria, for instance? Well, that would be true in, 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 any, other, in any other field of contention. And that's, it, it, it's sort of like the paradox of the red line, and I think Admiral Rogers mentioned that in one sense. On the one hand, if you put down a strict red line, you're committed to it. But on the other hand, it's precisely that commitment that makes that red line serious. In other words, you're constantly um, doing a risk evaluation, right? And so to bind yourself in alliance is to make that risk evaluation and to come down on one side rather than another, and that's what gives an alliance its power. Okay, now, there was a sort of another thread that I want to tease here is does what goes in cyberspace stay in cyberspace? Um, in other words, do we observe Las Vegas rules for cyberspace? I tend to be of the opinion that, for the most part, we should. But that's a whole other question. OK. Brad was next. Thank you, Brad Bigelow from uh, Shape. Uh, just an observation and then a question. Um, the observation, I would say, is this whole issue about attribution, and it actually goes to Martin's last comment. This is really relevant when we talk about mm -hmm. stuff on the internet. Okay, because we treat this, a lot of this is treating the internet as some vast and essentially ambiguous, it's like open seas. It's the open seas, a network equivalent of open seas. But that's actually not true, okay? Even the internet comes to ground. Even the internet is associated with physical instantiation. I don't think we're gonna have any issues with attribution on closed networks. Because closed networks means that you've gotten physical access to something which now becomes a much more uh, credible threat, and the evidence uh, is, is much more real. So first of all, is this, is this simply a reflection of our, our struggling to understand security in the context of the internet? And aren't we effectively going to come back to uh, understanding that it's like any other domain? It, it isn't a domain unto itself. And to, to a question, I guess, back to Martin, to put it in economic terms, one of the reasons that marketplaces get created is for transactional efficiency, right? You have, a, you have the ability to carry out transactions in, a, in an efficient manner. And I would argue 
Would you not agree that this is an area that once we can come to consensus that the internet is in fact simply another area in which national security issues take effect, that NATO is essentially the most efficient marketplace in which to carry out transactions and in, in organizing the responses, military or non-military? So I think that I think that consensus is going to have to wait until I pass from the scene. <laughs> Did anybody else want to pick that up, Martin? Yeah, right. I, I would actually like to jump into that question. Um, well, not into the question, but into the observation. So first of all, let me respond with a question back right back. Um, so actually, how closed is any network you are observing today? Because a closed network, in technical terms, is a computer. Uh, with, with, or two computers with a cable in between them and all other signal, signaling devices, so Bluetooth, wireless, um, anything else you can, um, there's been IR, uh, whatever else you have as a signaling device that's, cable, that's uh, capable of communicating, you have to take that out of the computer and turn it off. So that, that is, from, te from a technical point of view, what a closed network would be. But how often do you actually see this nowadays? So even if you just have, even if you are in, um, and I mean, there's, there's been loads of discussions on uh, Industry 4.0 about this, because that's exactly the, the problem they're facing now, is that they have networks which were designed to be closed, but they are no longer closed. So you actually don't really see closed networks anymore. So that was just one thought that I wanted to you know, push into the, the discussion. OK, Meryl, anything? I wanted to comment on on, um, on attribution and to look at it from the step prior to the attribution because we're talking a lot about attribution and who's what 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 are the best um, alliances or formulations to to improve that. But um, a prerequisite is that you have a notification of uh, a breach or that uh, someone agrees to to admit or or announce that something that there is an attack that needs to be attributed uh, and I, I would underline the value yet again of the uh, EU's GDPR in that uh, which uh, imposes a breach notification requirement that obliges any company or institution <coughs> processing uh, personal information to notify the relevant authorities within 72 hours and where this uh, becomes relevant uh, touches uh, yet another field that we haven't really uh, discussed, but that you brought out, uh, Kira, at the beginning, that is information operations, because uh, their GDPR becomes relevant um, um, uh, in the context of election interferences, as it implies, for example, that any potential breach to the databases of electoral uh, campaign teams will need to be notified rather than kept secret. And, uh, and that is the issue very often that uh, when when talking about attribution, we have to remind that many nations, companies, uh, organizations, associations uh, want to keep uh, uh, the uh, attack secret to begin with. So, uh, so that, that, that poses a difficulty for the attribution. That opens up the whole issue of transparency in itself, if it's coordinated and agreed, being a countermeasure in its own right. True, true. Lisa Past in the front row was, uh, was next. My name is Lisa Passan. I'm with the McCain Institute for International Leadership. And I'm afraid I'm having to unpark the attribution issue further. Sorry, here. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm increasingly uneasy with these conversations we're having about ideal coordinated action in cyberspace. Because fundamentally, they tend, any response account measure tends to rely on that attribution of a single one of those allies or coalition partners. And the digital forensics of one basically saying, we know it was them trust us and joined the attribution so that we can then act together. And I'm afraid we're getting out on really thin ice there where the political instinct is to attribute and we might be getting too far from the actual technical evidence in doing so. So how do we, in both this families, but also these teams of various sports metaphors that we've gotten carried away with. How do we avoid getting on that thin ice of where we go to find the political attribution for the sake of political signaling 
and, and taking action, but we don't get too carried away from the actual technical evidence that only one of the coalition partners allies might have and might, as Merla very eloquently just noted, not be particularly willing to share or even notify. Is there anybody in particular you wanted to answer? Okay, well, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> Kim presented a case study uh, in, in a non-cyber domain, but which I think carries over to partially provide a suggestion for an answer to your question. Uh, Kim explained the, the British government's response to the Skripal attack just over a year ago in Salisbury, where the, the approach was to release a limited amount of information in order to allow external organizations, in this case the world media and the media in Russia, to conduct their own investigations and determine what had happened. Now, I think that that is an analogy that under certain circumstances you can carry across into the cyber domain. Because in the place of the media and investigative journalists and Bellingcat and their friends, you have the cyber security companies that have the resources and the access to track down exactly the same kind of information based on the initial nudge from governments and therefore arrive at a conclusion which is not actually being presented on a plate by a national government, but is in fact uh, agreed among um, an organization that spans many different countries. Now, the one thing that we haven't actually mentioned in all of this conversation so far is the private sector, is the platforms, is the security organizations. And uh, my question, which if any of the rest of the panelists want to pick it up now, is if we are considering an organization whether formal and declared or, or informal and ad hoc, which is intended to respond to these challenges, need we necessarily be thinking only in terms of nation states joining it? Or should we, in fact, be considering broadening it out to organizations that are not nation states? For example, security organizations. For example, the NGOs that have been so active in countering information operations. Absolutely, and, and uh, companies. And, uh, uh, but then it's... It's not an alliance of states, indeed, but it, it's something uh, that goes beyond that. Uh, and uh, an, an NGO, uh, uh, an institute, uh, or, or, or whatnot. Uh, I think y you are very right that uh, when discussing these, uh, we cannot leave uh, other actors aside. And states are definitely not the only, only and, the, and the main actors here. Cyberspace does have the characteristic that private enterprises potentially play a much larger role than they do in other domains. Um, but you don't have to have them as part of coalitions. They'll take a check. Well, I'm <clears throat> sorry, my voice again. So first of all, um, I want to thank you for the question because I think it's excellent that um, there are other people who are actually bearing in mind that we don't can't, that we don't want to see a drift between policy makers and strategic operations and the technical people, um, and to to actually not leave out the digital forensics. Um, so, and uh, I also think to to add to what Marilyn said, I also think that it's crucial that we move away from. Um, an alliance that is purely based on state, in, uh, on state officials. I think it's a, it's a very good idea, and it's actually uh, one of the things that was demonstrated with the Salisbury um, attack case, where um, you did not just have media investigating the case based on the evidence provided, but actually also academia who were able to, to uh, get a portion of the, of the poison that was found um, in, this, in the Skripal's body and investigate that and, and make their own chemical analysis. So in, in the same perspective, you could do that with uh, cyber incidents. Because as I mentioned earlier in digital forensics, it's, it's not hard to make a copy. Now, of course, we have to discuss what type of information do we want to have in this copy? Because yes, you do disclose some of your um, information with opening your logs or whatever you have that you, that you use for the digital forensics. Um, but at the same time, the amount of, of information that you are releasing may, if you select wisely, not be that crucial. Okay. Can I make an additional note here? There's a big difference between getting the help from somebody and relying on, on the fact that that help is going to come in. Uh, about 20 years ago, a gentleman by the name of Eric Raymond made an argument about open source software to the effect that with enough eyes looking at the code, all bugs are shallow. 
Then a few years ago, we found out, in fact, that there was a lot of vulnerabilities in open code source software. Why? Because it, it turns out that not all the eyes were looking, that the eyes tended to clump in certain places and not other places, right? That the voluntary interest had certain, it had, was more interested in certain parts of the code than other parts of the code. One of the purposes of something like a government is to allocate attention appropriately and not to merely to go, and without it, you have an interest in things that are high profile, get people's attention, and less interest in those things that may not seem as high profile and not as important, but in fact merit just as much attention. So if I just may jump into that uh, uh, again. So there is a, a big difference from a technical perspective uh, from securing code and doing digital mm -hmm. forensics because securing code is like an open field. You have this code and you, there could be any type of, of vulnerabilities in it. Whereas for digital forensics, you do have a certain amount of, of logs or uh, files that you need to look at and you can draw conclusions from, from those. Now you may not get back to a 100% mm -hmm. sure of what has been uh, has been done uh, from the information you have, but you, it's it's another task. Um, so this should actually more be looked at um, in the way that academia works. So when you open up, for example, the um, the way you've been doing an experiment in your lab and the metho methodology you were using in your lab, and you open up on, for this uh, at a conference, describing it to the other academia, to to actually be able to to reproduce the results you were getting. This is more what what digital forensics would be like if you opened up um, to a, a global, let's not call it alliance, let's call it an organization. We have a few minutes remaining. Let's take a couple of questions, possibly three if they're very brief. I particularly invite the second row here to join in because I think I saw a couple of questions brewing and do put a hand up if, uh, if you want to launch it. Uh, let's take Maria first since she's ready. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Maria from the Singapore Ministry of Defense. Um, my question is kind of open to all the panelists, but um, perhaps mainly Professor Libicki and Ms. Hartman as well. So um, a lot of countries have come out to lay out their strategies about like persistent engagement, or um, in terms of the Japanese strategy, I'm not familiar with the details, but they've also come out to say that they're willing to disrupt attacks um, before they um, reach homeland, however you want to define that. And um, we had a very interesting panel um, with Dr. Smith from Stanford talking about how these strategies can actually cause friction among allies and partners if they're not really consulted beforehand or even informed before the fact. So how do you see the emergence of new um, coalitions or alliances where we are assuming that there's going to be a larger consensus on executing or managing efforts like persistent engagement? And how do you see that polarizing the world moving forward? Answer in 10 seconds. Maria, could you pass the microphone forward, please, to the second row here? Go ahead. Morning, Tyler Kim, U.S. Naval Academy. This question is open for any member of the panel. Um, this was kind of slightly touched on in the previous questions, but I would like to kind of hear a little bit more in-depth explanation. Um, in terms of a Baltic Cyber Alliance or a potentially a Cyber NATO, uh, how could this potentially give rise to a competing Cyber Alliance, perhaps on the Russian side? And uh, what kind of problems do you envision arising from such a competing alliance. Thank you. Okay, we have three minutes, so let's just um, draw stumps there. I told you I'd get the cricket in somehow. Martin, do you want to start <laughs> off with that one? Yeah, let me try to answer both questions, Siri Adam. Um, in terms of persistent engagement, the number of countries that actually can actually do it may be relatively small, and you have a smaller, uh, pro you have a smaller group. I'm not entirely certain whether persistent engagement is actually efficacious. Um, to a large extent because I think successes and failures are with a few, one rare exception, all classified. Okay, in terms of counter coalition building with the Russians, do these guys really have a whole lot of friends? <laughs> right, and maybe the Armenians and Belarus occasionally, but <clears throat> it, it, they play in different worlds. They really do. Which is not to say that they don't have alliances of their own. So the cyber and information security elements of the, uh, of the CSTO, for example, the SCO information security agreement, <laughs> all look like counter coalitions. All in fact represent something slightly different as Martin was alluding to, because even within the CSTO, not everybody thinks that Russia is your friend, even if it's your ally. So yes, there is a self-limiting factor there in terms of the responses that the other side could put forward. But again, you, you also have the mirror image of there is one big player adversary and a lot of people that might coalesce around them and, and uh, generally 
follow the same view whether or not they're actually engaging in active operations. So yes, it is, uh, it is an issue, but I think it is not one that would be aggravated in any way by any form of um, closer coalition or agreement between Western liberal democracies, because that agreement is basically already in place. And I throw the open-ended working group in, the, in, in that course, dot yes. as well. I mean, an initiative uh, proposed in, within the UN, proposed by Russia, to uh, study the uh, establishing regular institutional dialogue and, and study study norms, uh, which uh, is being uh, uh, um, countered by the uh, group of governmental experts studying the uh, in how international law applies to state action in cyberspace and, and uh, how to promote compliance with the existing norms. Now in the very short time we have remaining, did anybody want to grip Maria's question? Or is that uh, one to one pack over coffee? I would just uh, quickly say that I believe that friction um, among allies uh, may of course arise, but I don't think it's a problem because I just think it's a, it's a discussion that we would have as we do in democratic um, states on a constant basis. Seems like a good time to end. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining in what's been a fascinating session. There are things here that we could talk about uh, all day, probably all week. But uh, please join me thanking the panelists and enjoy the coffee break. Thank you.